G'day guys, welcome back to Friday Knockoffs, brought to you by our friends at Pepper Jack. This week on the show, former Port Adelaide and North Melbourne star Jasper Pittard. He's doing incredible things post-footy for the environment and he's got so many funny footy stories. I can't wait to chat to him. He's actually waiting for me now. I'll check him out. Oh, Jasper, how are you, my man? Good, deal. Good, Good to see, see you. you. Thanks for coming. What's going on? Not much, just uh, been waiting for you, mate. Yeah, sorry, mate, I was a bit late. I got hold up at the office. Oh, good. It's hard running a big business these <laughs> days. Um, how's your week been? It's been really good, actually. Um, pretty cruisy work-wise. Um, got a good win in my futsal final last <laughs> night, so we're, in, we're into the granny, so it's all going well. People, was, we were just talking off air before about um, Cam, about injuries and, like, doing calves post-football. It's just, it's, it's a bit weird. Like, people who hurt themselves when they don't play sport anymore, I just can't fathom it. Yeah, well, I uh, unfortunately think I did do my calf last night and um, I'll try to push through next week, but the reality is we get to the ground five minutes before the game starts. No warm-up, hard floors. Like, it's <laughs> no wonder I've done... And I played squash on Tuesday night, which probably didn't help, so... Yeah, it doesn't help. Um, hey, mate, let's talk about you. Post-football, what are you up to at the moment working with the AFL uh, players for Climate Action? How's that all going? It's going really well. So, yeah, Tom Campbell and I um, started the, the charity... About this time last year actually um yeah trying to support uh passionate players around both competitions who want to um, speak out about climate action and uh yeah really trying to i guess progress things in the industry and help transition our industry to a more sustainable one um we think there's a great opportunity for for the afl to really lead the space um with it standing in australian society and uh we think players um yeah have a really good opportunity to kind of lead the charge so it's been been a busy year and a half, but I'm um, really enjoying it. Love it, mate. You're doing incredible things. I want to talk more about that later, but first, let's set the scene. <laughs> One of my favourite players to watch, I, I, I will be honest, I love the way you, you took on the game. Um, Port Adelaide and, and the Kangaroos. How would you get into footy? What are your earliest memories? Well, like you, mate, it was down at the Fitzroy Junior Footy Club. Um, I guess Oz kick before that, I remember Dad taking me down to um, Edinburgh Gardens Oval there, and I think also in Royal Park there for a bit, but just pretty standard junior footy, um, yeah, up, up through the ranks. I split my time a bit between Melbourne and, and Torquay, where my dad lived at the time. Um, mum being in uh, Melbourne and then, yeah, played for Fitzroy Juniors in Torquay and then, um, yeah, Calder Cannons and Geelong Falcons and then, yeah, just the standard, you know, entry point into the AFL, getting drafted and off to Adelaide as an 18 year old. That, that, so you played with two TAC Cup clubs? Yeah, so I was uh, like sort of under 14s, 15s, 16s with the Cannons. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I grew up in Brunswick, so I was, that's where I was zoned. Um, but uh, I moved down to Torquay with my dad and my stepmom uh, as a 16 year old, just after the 16s carnival with the Cannons. Um, so yeah, didn't resume TSC Cup till 18 next year. Um, but yeah, just made the switch to the Falcons, pretty seamless from, from memory. Yeah. Unbelievable. Um, you were known at draft camp, apparently, from reports and the research that we do, as one of the best question answerers at the draft camp. What does this mean? What, what was uh, your interviewing skills like? Yeah, I don't know. Does um, anything stand out? I do remember, like, interviewing most clubs, like, getting interviewed by most clubs. Um, I don't know. I think growing up, I was quite used to having conversations with adults. I don't know if that but it had anything to do with it, but I felt pretty comfortable. I also um, wasn't able to complete all the physical testing at the camp, so m maybe I was thinking this is my only real chance to kind of prove, you know, I'm a valuable pickup um, outside of the physical stuff. But, um, yeah, mate, I don't know. I, I, I remember I've seen a few quotes, so I think Brad Scott and Paul Roos mentioning that I interviewed really well, and I do get asked that from time yeah. to time, but I couldn't tell you what I said. <laughs> Did they um, ever say anything weird? Like, I know back in the day that was, like, something that was scary. They always, like, threw these curveball questions. I don't know if it happened yeah. anymore. Was anything weird got asked? I remember a very specific one, uh, interviewing with Hawthorne, and I think it was Alistair Clarkson, one of the recruiters basically said, all right, you know, we've picked you up, you're in your first year, you're playing, you're in your first or second game. Um, we're playing Collingwood, I think was the example. Scott Penderbury's out there, but he's got a bit of a sore knee. It's pretty common knowledge. Clarko's telling you, like, I just want you to go up and just whack his knee, whack his knee. Like, would you do it? And I just, I can't remember what I said. I think I paused and I was just like, what's the right thing to yeah. say? <laughs> yeah. It was probably just like, 
yeah, well, whatever the coach wants me to do, I'll, I'll do it. Do it <laughs> within, 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 you know, the boundaries of the game. But um, certainly not the kind of player I am. So I'm glad I never actually got asked to do that. Love that. So <laughs> I don't know if that happens anymore. Hey, um, Pepper Jack's all about character and you've got that in space. I've got a question for you on this beautiful card here. If you were a recruiter today, what would you be looking for in young footballers? Yeah, it's a good question. And um, I think... I think to bring players in these days, you don't want just someone who can merely play the game. I think you, you know, particularly teams and um, my old, one of my old clubs, Kangaroos, are in this young phase at the moment where they're trying to build a group and a culture. Um, I think you really just want to look past just the playing ability and what, what kind of person they are, what kind of qualities do they bring, I guess culturally. So that will add to that because um, you can train the, the footy skills, you know, day in, day out, that's something you can train and get better at. I think the quality of a person and not even necessarily as a leader or anything, but just like having good people around clubs is really important. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's tough, though, because I think other important qualities are, you know, work ethic and, and ability to work with others. And um, yeah, but it, it would be a tough job. I mean, I don't know, some clubs seem to do it really well, but it, it is a tough one. Um, and I think you can pick up players early, late. It's hard to, hard to know where they're going to come from, but yeah. Yeah, it's so hard. It's, it's, a, it's a mixed bag. I remember watching the documentary, The Brady Six, and there's a bit like Tom Brady and the six people that got picked up before him in the yeah. draft, and they analyse like, you know, speed and all these things, but what they didn't analyse and what Tom Brady says is like his grit and his like work ethic, which is hard to measure, like you, you really can't, but I think they were saying about, you know, standing up in games, standing up in close wins and all those sort of things. I think, like, now, if I was ever a recruit, I'd look at, you know, and you, obviously these are the later picks too because the first top ten and nearly first round's pick for you, but you'd look for those players, like, um, that do it well. Like, John Newcomb, for example, come through the hard way and you just love players like that. Yeah. And they just do it. They do it super well. Yeah, no, you're right. And I think it is hard to tell, uh, you know, when kids are teenagers or 18, like, do they have that? I mean, they might have shown that ability at times, yeah. but maybe they haven't even developed that yet. So, yeah, it's a tough gig recruiting. Um, a lot of responsibility on them, I guess. Mm. You ended up at Port. Were you happy with that? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I was um, stoked, obviously, to get drafted. Um, I think I do remember people at the club early on saying, I think it was myself, John Butcher and Andrew Moore who got drafted together. Um, and out of the three... Um, the people at the club said, oh, Jasper will be fine. We don't need to worry about him getting homesick. Um, I, I, I don't know. I'd done a bit of moving around as a, as a teenager. I, I was really happy to go and explore a new city and kind of be my own person. So I, I loved it. Um, I didn't find it too difficult. I think, you know, eventually I came back to Melbourne and I was definitely ready to come home. But um, I really loved it. And I think at Port at the time, over 50% of the list were from, weren't from Adelaide. So we were really tight and... Um, yeah, really relied on each other and built some really strong friendships. Yeah, I love that when when to Sydney and you move away with guys that aren't from areas, you come together as like a little family almost yeah. um, in that time. Hey, some incredible stories though that you've you've got at Port. Um, one being the punctured lung, which is a serious story, but it's sort of in hindsight pretty crazy how you had to, to manage that and get back home. Can you talk us through that one? Yeah, so that was 2012. This is a pretty crap year for me. Um, 2011 was like my first kind of year of playing Rising Star nomination and like felt really good about it and then I just had hammy injuries all pre-season all throughout the first half I missed, missed 10 weeks at one stage it was getting to a point where we we're like like you have to take extra time if we can't get this hammy right anyway eventually like finally worked my way back in and got a game and we we're playing Melbourne in Darwin and yeah just before quarter time was on Neville Jetta like running out to the wing defending him hard um, and Chad Wingard, my own teammate, came back actually super courageously, like back with the flight, like, but he kneed me straight in the, in the ribs, oh. like really hard. I went like completely horizontal and smacked down and yeah, basically cracked ribs, punctured lung. And it was a pretty awful experience because I couldn't breathe, got off the ground. They put me in like a wheelchair in, in the rooms and I was just thinking like, you know, I couldn't blow the, the whistle, um, suck it up because I had because I had a punctured lung. So I had no pain relief. And then um, oh my God. they had an ambulance there, but there has to always be an ambulance at the ground. So I couldn't actually just get in that. They had to get another ambulance there. And it just took forever. And we were just, we're on Darwin time. So it was just, everything felt, felt like it was taking forever. And I'm thinking oh, I'm about to have my last breath because I can't actually breathe. Anyway, eventually got in the 
um, ambulance and I think they must have given me morphine or something and a bit of pain relief. But yeah, with a punctured lung, you can't fly for a month. So I had to catch the GAN back from Darwin to Adelaide, <laughs> which is pretty funny. I mean, a lot of people, I mean, a lot of oldies love the GAN and it's a 48 hour trip. Yeah, um, explain that what that is. Cause when you told, I didn't even know what that was. I didn't even know there, there yeah, was a train that did that. So the GAN, the GAN is a scenic, Tray, train that goes straight up the middle of Australia from Adelaide to, to Darwin and it's a 48 hour trip. Um, there's a few stops. I was really lucky to be given a gold class seat so I had a bed. Um, I think they're about $2,000 a ticket or something. Um, Dad flew up and, and sat on the train with me so I had a bit of company. Um, but yeah, I guess I've done the GAN so, and I didn't have to pay for it so that was nice. But you know, mainly kind of middle aged to older people <laughs> doing the senior and it's yeah, you're just basically looking at the desert for the whole time. <laughs> I, uh, I was just watching movies and um, sleeping really, but um, I guess I've ticked that off. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure it was on the bucket list, but I've ticked it off. <laughs> Are you going to head back? Would you ever catch the gain again? Oh, I don't think I need to because yeah. it's a long time. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Maybe it feels a bit quicker, but yeah. um, I do like trains, but 48 hours was a fair stint. Yeah, you've, um, you've done a lot of firsts in your career. One of them, some, a lot, most good, some not so good. Um, and the other one was Gold Coast first win, which you played a, in the game and you might have played a role in. Can you talk us through this one? Yeah, I think it, it might go down as one of my proudest moments in, in Gold Coast football club <laughs> history is handing them their first win on a silver platter. Um, yeah, we, we played him in like round four or five of 2011, so my first season, and we had the game under control. I think we're 40 points up at three-quarter time, but... Gary Ablett Jr. just started getting going. He kicked a pretty incredible goal um, just before three-goal time. That just gave him enough. And I reckon just we still had him on toast, but then the last 15 minutes, last quarter, they just got on a roll and it's just goal, goal, getting close. And we weren't Tight very up. good either yeah. at the time, so we were just starting to really tighten up. And we were maybe f less than a goal up. I, I was taking kickouts, which was probably the first mistake letting him fifth game I can do kick outs um, and I just remember thinking like I'm going to get this ball out of here <laughs> played onto myself for a bit of distance and I've tried to kick the pants off it and Harley Bennell was on the mark and I've just kicked it straight into him and then but I saw it it's bounced off him and I've got oh, I've got to redeem myself and I've sprinted over ground ball I heard one of my teammates voice for the hands but I've done the like no looker I've looked up and I've just missed him by a metre then I've gone all right redeem myself jumped in, like dived on the ball head first, pretty, I thought pretty courageously, because um, there's a goal coach player coming, but the ball just trickled out to Luke Russell in front of goal and he just snapped it and <laughs> kicked the goal. <laughs> and then I was like, cry. it was just a comedy of errors, um, trying really hard to rectify each one and just making it worse each time. And they uh, held on and we had, Justin Westhoff had a shot after the siren to win us the game. So I like to put the blame on him, but um, I think, yeah, I didn't help. I didn't help with that moment. So I know we talk about moments like Shane Biggs's moment in mm. the grand final, that repeat efforts. Like mine was like the negative version yeah. of that. <laughs> so, but, you know, you can laugh about it. Definitely. Um, haven't Definitely. had it brought up for a while, so that's good. Good. Well, you're very chance to turn into a meme um, after yeah. today. Not so, that was not so positive. One positive one, though, was around 2014. And, like, I think that was when I was in, like, my peak love of footy and seeing Port Adelaide who had been struggling for so long, like coming and just playing like, I think still to this day, like the probably the most aggressive brand of football like I've ever seen. And I just have flashbacks of you. And I, you know, I was in the system at that time. And I remember just like even playing Port and it was just this thing of like, you were just running off the back of the square, like no man as a backman, which was just unseen, un, like unseen, unheard of at that time. What were your memories of that time? And what was the brand like of playing and that flow that you had? Yeah, yeah. Well, so I guess when Ken came in uh, at the end of 2012, um, yeah, we weren't going well. Personally, I was just injured all the time. And then that 2013, we just kind of made finals. No one expected us to. Uh, won, won a final, lost a close one to Geelong, and we carried on like we'd won the granny because, like, who expected us to play finals? And then, like, 2014, a bit more expectation, but we just had a solid year. And as you mentioned, like... I guess when Ken came in, it was a lot of, I mean, there's a big emphasis on fitness. We had Darren Burgess, so like, yeah, you had to be able to run. Um, and pre-seasons were tough, but we just had this incredibly, like, like repeat speed fit group. 
Oh, I think we had at one stage like 12 blokes running under 10 minute 3Ks and right. like day one of pre-season like. So pretty like really fit but Ken gave us this really licensed to run and carry because he knew that we had the fitness to do it and still be able to get back and defend. And so that was really fun way to play. Um, and then, yeah, we just had this great run and we lost the prelim in 2014 to Hawthorne by three points, which was a bit Devo, but then they went and smashed Sydney the next week. So we always say the classic, oh, we would have won the granny that year if we had a beat him, but you know, we probably would have got smashed by Sydney, who knows? But um, yeah, it was, it was a great time and it was, Pre zones like where you had yeah. the six six six, so teams were like putting a seventh off the back of the square, and Ken would just go just sprint through, try and get the ball, and then pump it inside. And that was often me or um, you know Brad Eberts, Hamish Hartlett's, whoever it was. So um, bit of license there, and then yeah, the games always evolving and tightening up and making it not as fun. Trying to make it not as fun sometimes, but you know we find a way. So. Um, yeah, I mean, it was it was a nice way to play. I probably overdid it at times and took me a long time to find the balance of, you know, controlled risk-taking. Um, I'm sure if you ask most Port fans, they'll, they'll be able to talk about that. But um, I guess by the time I got to 2016, I kind of really found the balance yeah. and I had a really good season. And, I mean, unfortunately, I mean, I tried to do everything the same I did in the following years after that, but it's just weird footy. Like, you do... You have a good year and you think, all right, I'll just emulate that the next year. And then you play crap and you're like, what's going on? Like, So it's just like, who knows sometimes. So I admire the players who are just so good all the time. I mean, I don't know what the form there is, but I was able to have a couple of good seasons here and there. But um, that consistency was probably something that was always a bit difficult. Consistency, I couldn't agree more. Like, I can't respect players enough. They can just continue to back up and back up um, each year. And even talking about the game... It's so crazy, like the rules change, but they still just continue to do their thing, whereas it affects everyone else so much. Yeah. Um, the move to North, how'd that come about? Move home. Yeah, so, um, yeah, my, so uh, as I mentioned, like 2016, great year at Port, um, signed a three year deal, and then the next two years were just a bit kind of lackluster performance wise for me. I, a few injuries, like I started both seasons with a hammy, which is, is just. You know, for me with the history anyway, it wasn't great, but just coming, finding my way back into the team form and basically just the business of footy really. Like I was, you know, pretty happy at Port and loved the group and all that. But I guess long, long story short is um, they approached me and said, would you look, you know, is there an opportunity elsewhere for you? You know, for you, but also I think they were looking at some players to bring in and, I had a year on the contract and that's just the way it goes. So I was a bit flat at the time, but that's footy. You can't, you can't linger on those things. And I, so I kind of went away and had a think and spoke to, you know, people close to me. And I had a really good bit of advice from Nathan Bassett, who was my backs coach at Port, who still works at, at Port now, I think, as a forwards coach. He just basically said, um, how much footy do you think you got in you? And people who know me well would have known back then I would have been saying... I don't really care that much about footy. I'm happy to play out another year and then I'm done. But he said, I think, you know, if you've got the love for it, you, you've got another five years in you. And that kind of just made me think, well, maybe a change would be really good. And going home um, to, to Melbourne is something I was always going to do. So it's sort of like, well, it's going to happen anyway. So um, through the hat in the ring, North was the only <laughs> taker and had a good meeting with Brad Scott. Um, it made me feel like there was a role for me there. And... That was it really, there wasn't anyone else knocking on the door and they chucked me in with Jared Pollock, so I was pretty lucky there. They, I had a pretty good year in 2017, uh, 2019, sorry, at North my first year and they were calling me the steak knives of the deal, so I think that was <laughs> a nice tag to have. Um, but yeah, I, I absolutely loved my time, particularly in the first year at North, really liked the group, the, the, the environment Brad Scott had created over 10 years, um, really suited me, really inclusive environment, really respectful, um, thought that, yeah, just generally as a whole club, uh, really community feel, talked a lot about the things that are, are really important to me, like equality and um, community and respect. So, you know, um, and yeah, I, I just loved it. Um, I felt like I was really able to be myself at North, which I'm very, really thankful for, because that can be a hard thing sometimes in footy, because you do have to fit into a team and team culture but I felt like that was a great environment for individuals to to shine through and be who they are and then um yeah like 
like I said, um, off the back of that, was elevated to the leadership group, which was, you know, a really proud moment for me. And then unfortunately just the hub in COVID year was just a shocker for, I think for everyone in, in the world, but you know, in the AFL industry, just a shocker. Um, being away from home, being under pressure, we weren't performing well, you know, just, uh, you've been in footy long mm. enough. When, when things, when, when the pressure's on, things turn to shit generally, um, or the good clubs able to manage it, but we were just away from our home base and we didn't have, you know, we lost good people and it just, yeah, it was really, it was a really tough year for everyone at North, but I think for everyone in the industry. Yeah. Where to for North now? Is it, is like, do you think they need to do something particularly to get back to where they are or are you confident um, that we can turn it around? Look, I'm not, I'm not too sure. It's hard to know when you're not there in the four walls, but I do know, you know, some of my former teammates who were there are, are, are great people. Um, I think they've brought in some great people to the club. Uh, I think the reality is they're a young list. Um, it's going to take time and in an industry where patience isn't often accepted too much. And I get it because it's hard watch, as a fan to watch your club battle and it's obviously been a difficult year for them. But mm. I think, you know, all that talk about them relocating, like you, I'm personally thinking like that can't be allowed to happen because they're just such an important Melbourne club. Um, really proud history. And for the reasons I spoke about before, they've got such a great culture, community feel. They do a lot of great work for that region. Um, that maybe not everyone knows about. That That is, it's more than just footy, what they provide to the community, that club, and all clubs really, but I think North particularly do really great work with their huddle program. And I just think it's a bit of a patience thing and getting, you know, some good players in. They've got some good players just developing in time, but yeah, it's obviously difficult time for them and I'm sure it'll turn around though. Yeah, I'm sure it will. A lot of clubs have done it. Hey, so post-football, um, AFL players with climate action work with it now. As a as a commu AFL community, um, as players, as past players, as watchers, what can we all do better that's going to help, you know, the environment? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question and I think, you know, a big part of why Tom Campbell and I have formed this group is because... Um, we need to be more educated. We need to educate players and footy fans and, and the broader public about what's happening in the world. And I, I think, you know, that job's becoming easier because the information's more accessible. And I think, you know, based off the last election, people are starting to get where we're at with climate and, and how important it is to start progressing. Um, but I guess there's just so many things individually you can do on a, on a, on a daily basis. Um, changing attitudes and behaviours around, you know, your waste and um, and stuff like that, where you direct your money, where you invest your money, uh, making sure it's not, you know, fueling the fossil fuel, pardon the pun, industries, that kind of stuff. But um, I think the biggest thing for us and what we want to do as an organisation is really talk about the solutions in an authentic way. Um, there's really passionate AFL M and W players in our competitions who care about this stuff and do good work. And um, we want to kind of bring light to those stories and connect that with fans and, and people who might not be engaged in, in the climate conversation. Um, we we hear enough about the doom and gloom of, of the state of the world. We, we want to kind of talk more about the great things that are happening and can happen and, and you know, just getting a bit of a move on. So I think footy play and sport generally just plays a really important role. Um, and I guess as well, like whether you sort of agree a, about climate change or not, if you love footy and you want to see the, the future of our game be strong and, and, and protected from any impact in society, then I think this is a, a, a really important thing to jump on because that's what we're trying to do, protect the future of the planet and our game. So a um, bit of a long-winded answer, but um, yeah, just kind of keep in tune with what we're doing and the stories we're trying to tell and, 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 and learn as, and learn with us. Like yep. It's a journey we're all on. Yeah, love it. And make sure you check out the socials, AFLPA for Climate Action. The thing I love about you guys is is it's not about, um, you know, telling people what to do. It's educating, knowing that we all come from different experiences of this. I knew absolutely nothing about it before I started chatting with you. So doing incredible things, I'd urge anyone to check it out. Friday night, so that's what we're here for. The footy's on soon. What's your Friday night ritual now? These days, um yeah, well, it's gotten a bit colder recently, so I've actually been just hanging at home. A couple of reds, a couple of pepper jacks maybe tonight. Um, but, you know, when, what I love about Melbourne is um, 
yeah, there's just so much going on. And coming back to Melbourne for me, like, uh, you know, as much as I love footy, I love everything else uh, Melbourne has to offer. So if, whether it's a gig or just going to the pub with mates and hanging out with my friends from school that you don't see as much. Um, but funnily enough, tonight I am going to the footy, um, Carlton St Kilda. Um, so grew up in a family of tragic St Kilda supporters. I was once one myself, so I've got a little soft spot for them still. Um, so I'm gonna have a little dinner with uh, some friends and family, really hoping the Saints get up because, um, yeah, be hurting for the family if they don't. It's um, be a tough watch, yeah. but it should be a good game. And I don't go to the footy very often, but um, be interesting. Yeah, go on and just having a look. I don't, yeah. I don't have an emotional connection to the game anymore. It's, it's too hard. <laughs> you say that now, wait till you get there. Well, anyway, hopefully you enjoy. Here's another little bottle of Pep Jack for you, my friend, to enjoy. Thanks so much for Beauty. catching up. I think the Blues get it done tonight. But always good to catch up. Thank you. Good to see you.